Hello, I'm Alex and welcome to the History Chronicles. If you like our work then please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel in return for exclusive perks, please visit our Patreon page. Now, on with the video. Who founded New York City and what made the Big Apple the symbol of American economics and innovation? Let's find out in today's episode of the History Chronicles. Today's History Chronicle begins before Europeans set foot on the American continent at a time when Native Americans inhabited the land, including the area which would become known as New York City. The Mohicans or Mahicans were an Algonquin language-based culture living in the region. They used the territory to hunt and fish. When the Europeans began to settle in the area, Many of the Mohicans would relocate their villages in order to trade and form a defensive alliance with their new European neighbours. However, the important question is, who exactly were these new European neighbours? Unlike the colonies at Jamestown, Virginia and Plymouth in Massachusetts, the men and women who settled in what would become New York City were not English, but Dutch from the United Provinces of the Netherlands. However, the thought of a Dutch colony had not originated in the Netherlands, but in England during the Renaissance. The English turned to Henry Hudson, an English navigator, to find the Northwest Passage to circumvent the Ottoman Empire's trade monopoly. Before his voyage, he received letters from his close friend John Smith, who in 1607 led the founding of the Jamestown colony. The letters contained maps of the coastline and spurred the theory that one of the rivers would lead to the Sea of Cathay, the European's name for China. Although this information was misguided, as the Native Americans were talking about the connection of the Hudson River to the Mohawk River Valley, which joined the Great Lakes. The most important voyage would take place in 1609, when Hudson sailed for the Dutch East India Company aboard the ship, the Half Moon. He hugged the coastline until he came within 10 miles of the Jamestown settlement, stopping and turning around. It would not be until late August of 1609 that Hudson would enter into what would become New York Harbour. On his return home, Hudson stopped in Dartmouth, England, where the English forbade him from sailing with the Dutch again. It would not be until 1624 that an official Dutch colony would be founded with colonists arriving on the Fortune and Abraham sacrifice. Unlike other colonies, the area which would become New Netherlands needed to attract people away from the rich city of Amsterdam and into the rugged terrain of New Netherlands. They primarily settled on the island of Manhattan, calling it New Amsterdam. Eventually, the settlers purchased the land from the Native Americans for 60 guilders worth of gold, or $24. After 20 years, the Dutch would lose control of its colony on the 8th of September 1664, when the English arrived and threatened war if they did not surrender the colony. The colony would be renamed New York, after the Duke of York, who had organised the capture of the colony. The Dutch would retake New York from the English in 1673, but ultimately lost control again in 1674. By 1684, New York would become the first city to receive a royal charter from the king. As a result of the English takeover of the colony, more Europeans flooded there, quickly populating it. As a result, New York acquired an identity crisis, as its mixed Anglo-Dutch ethnicity bordered both the Iroquois Confederacy along with French Canada. This foreshadowed conflict, which came to a head during the French and Indian Wars, an extension of the Seven Years' War. From 1754 to 1763, the colonial forces of the American colonies were pitted against the French colonial forces. Much of the fighting took place in the Ohio Valley, yet due to its strategical importance, Albany, just north of New York City, would serve as the headquarters for the British forces. Much of the early fighting resulted in poor battlefield performances by the British, including the defeat of General Edward Braddock and his young colonial officer, George Washington, at the Battle of Monongahela. The tide of the war started to turn towards the end of the war, as the French supply lines were unable to cope with the strain of war, resulting in a humiliating defeat and the seizure of most French lands on the continent. Despite the victory, the British crown had got deeply into debt as a result of the war, and in an effort to restore its treasury, it took to taxing the colonies. The British Parliament passed many taxes upon the colonies, including the Currency Act, which removed currency from circulation, and the Sugar Act, which taxed imports on essential trade with the Caribbean. Both of these acts were passed in 1764, while in the following year, the Stamp Act was passed. The Stamp Acts taxed all paper products and saw the first organised resistance to colonial authority through the Sons of Liberty. When the American Revolution broke out in New England, New York City soon saw action around it. General William Howe was defeated by George Washington at the minor Battle of Harlem Heights 
but that victory was soon offset by the loss at the Battle of White Plains. Following this defeat, the British took control of New York City, and it remained the headquarters for the British until 1783. New York City soon became the centre of the Loyalist press, and the region as a whole was taken over by the British troops who occupied it. While some benefited from the arrival of the troops, others resented them. But New York City would be the main focus of the British war effort due to the Hudson River's strategic importance as a supply chain from Canada through to New York City. If the British could separate the revolutionaries in Boston from the southern states, they would be able to stop the colonists' ability to coordinate. Ultimately, though, this was only a theory, as the British would be defeated at the Battle of Yorktown on the 19th of October 1781, and would withdraw from New York City on the 25th of November 1783. Following the war, George Clinton continued his governorship, and officially became the first governor of the state of New York. He addressed many of the problems of post-colonial life, especially the remaining Loyalists, by controversially taking Loyalist land to open land ownership to others, in the process bolstering the state's finances. Though Clinton's opponents, like Philip Schuyler and Alexander Hamilton, opposed the violation of property rights, the land distribution did help state development. Upon New York's ratification of the Constitution, New York City had the honour of being the first capital of the new nation, and host to the inauguration of President George Washington in 1789. New York soon became the economic and innovative centre for the newly formed United States, and from its combination of political connections, a new title would emerge – the Empire State. By the 1800s, the United States and Great Britain were back to hostile relations, as New York City's trade was threatened through the impressment of American sailors into the Royal Navy. Not only were American sailors being taken, but New York City's harbour was blockaded, further fueling the flames. War would break out in 1812 and concluded by 1850, bringing relief to New York City with the freeing of the harbour. Ten years later, in 1825, the Erie Canal's construction was finished, connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes for the Americans. It would be seen as a wedding between the farm and the city, and would lead to a new era of growth and prosperity for the state. At the time, the Erie Canal was one of the most ambitious and expensive projects in the nation. As a result of the canal, New York City would be the new gateway to the West and open up the expansion of the nation. New York City would now become America's Empire City, and would be the reason behind New York's economic position within the United States. Yet only four years after the Erie Canal was completed, the railroad made its way to New York. By the 1840s, New York would be leading the way in railroad innovation. By the 1830s, the workers in New York City started to oppose both landlords and their bosses. Strikes began to become a popular way to show their discontentment, and in an effort to mobilise collective bargaining, trade groups created the General Trades Union in 1833. By the following year, the GTU had enough state support to approach Congress with the first representative of organised labour. Because of this increase in unions, New York City went from having only two strikes in 1833 to 18 in 1836, leading to the year being called the Year of Strikes. Anti-labour forces feared revolution until New York City ruled trade unions illegal, leading to 30,000 people, or one-fifth of the city population, to protest. It would be only days later that a jury would overturn the ruling in Hudson, making labour protests legitimate. In 1837, the panic occurred, which saw one of the first major depressions in the commercial era. One third of New York's labour force was unemployed, and relief organisations were unprepared for the mass of people desperate for aid. One event which resulted from the panic of 1837 was the flower riot, as the urban poor believed the flower merchants were hoarding flour. They broke into their storehouses and dumped flour into the streets for the people to take. The disturbance was only broken up when the militia arrived, but it highlighted the urban population's interdependence on the different regions within New York State. By the 1840s, the anti-rent movement began, as land was seen as the key to independence, freedom and security. But by now, New York also had the nation's first slum, the infamous Five Points. During the 1840s and 1850s, there was a massive boom in immigration especially from Ireland, as the Irish were fleeing from the potato famine. By 1855, Irish immigrants represented 52% of the population of the Five Points, while immigrants made up 51% of New York City's total population. Going into the 1860s, New York City had become a stop on the Underground Railroad, and was frequently visited by activists like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. When the nation went to war, New York was divided between upstate Republicans and downstate Democrats. 
New York City merchants organised rallies to support the South, and talk started about seceding from the nation and the establishment of a free trade zone. The city erupted in July of 1863 for four days, resulting in the death of over a hundred people and hundreds of injuries. The draft riot, as it would be known, was stopped once federal troops returned to the city following the Battle of Gettysburg. From 1865 to 1900, New York City experienced the Gilded Age and an era of economic corruption. In 1876, Central Park was completed as the first public park, giving New York an escape from the urban city. America was booming into the richest country in the world, and New York was the symbol of the American dream. As a result, immigrants flocked to the city, and especially to Ellis Island, which opened in 1892 to process the new wave of immigrants from Europe. Along with Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, a gift from France on the 28th of October 1886, stood at the gateway of New York City, welcoming all who entered. Due to political and religious persecution, many of the immigrants came from southern and eastern Europe. In 1898, New York City as we know it would be established, when the five boroughs of Staten Island, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens and Manhattan were incorporated into a single city charter. New York City entered into a progressive period at the beginning of the 20th century, as the first subway was founded in 1904. Later that year, the first fireworks display on New Year's Eve started, sponsored by the New York Times, marking the beginning of the traditional New Year's Eve ball drop, which is watched around the world today. On the 25th of March 1911, a tragedy struck New York City in the form of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, killing 146 workers. As a result, drastic changes were made following the Women's Trade Union League strike, when 36 new pieces of legislation were introduced. As part of the progressive movement, the temperance movement, headed by the Anti-Saloon League, had made legislative progress to ban alcohol in what would become the Prohibition Era. Despite the alcohol ban in New York City alone, there were an estimated 32,000 speakeasies, or hidden bars, serving alcohol. While the era of prohibition was known as the Roaring Twenties, the economic boom soon came to an end when the stock market crashed on the 29th of October 1929. The stock market crash of 1929 reverberated across the world, and New York City was hit the hardest. It would be during the Great Depression that major public works projects would be organised to provide jobs such as the Empire State Building, completed in 1931. With the outbreak of war in 1941 with Japan and Germany, New York City would see an economic resurgence and boom following the war. Yet by the 1950s, right through to 1975, New York as a whole faced an ageing industrial sanction and an industrial waste issue. Besides the ageing industry, the 1960s brought the civil rights movement, sparking protests and civil unrest against racial inequality. New York City by the 60s and 70s had become known as a city that was dangerous to visit, and in an attempt to brighten its reputation, it started a new tourism campaign in 1971, become known as the Big Apple, by making its city logo an apple. However, by 1975 New York City was shaken again by another fiscal collapse, when the banks refused to loan the city more money after it overspent its budget, in an effort to expand and support social services and provide benefits for its municipal employees. New York City would be bailed out by the federal government after pressure from other American and European cities. The effect of events in New York City would not only be felt in New York, but also around the world, when on the 11th of September 2001, terrorists flew two planes into the World Trade Center's Twin Towers, the tallest buildings in New York at the time, killing 3,000 people. This attack was not only a physical attack, but a symbolic attack on New York City and on America's wealth and power. New York City would then be faced with another financial collapse which occurred in 2007 when banks loaned money to those they knew would be unable to repay the debt. New York City would, however, recover faster than other cities due to its housing market being less affected. When banks were bailed out during the Great Recession using taxpayer money, the Occupy Wall Street movement was launched as a response. Many who created the crisis received massive bonuses, and the Occupy Wall Street movement would highlight the gap between the 1% and the 99% as a result. Thirteen years after the 9-11 attacks, New York City finished construction on the One World Trade Center in 2014, marking an era of renewal after the terrorist attacks. Then, in March of 2020, COVID-19 shut down New York City, along with the rest of the world. This has led to another period of financial hardship for the city, and New York City has yet to recover like other parts of the country. As New York City begins to head into 2022, it is faced once again with a declining population as a result of economic hardship, a change of American business practices, seeing businesses moving away from the Big Apple. 
The question is, what will New York City do to remain a focal point for commerce and innovation, and retain its focus as a huge part of American culture? You've been watching the History Chronicles. We'd love to know what you think of New York City. Please let us know below, and if you enjoyed our video, please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Also, if you'd like to support our work going forward, please visit our Patreon page. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles.